leadership starts with you. You know, it's your orientation, it's your ability to build teams, it's your ability to give feedback, it's your ability to understand the needs of people who aren't in the room that's going to make a difference. I would hope that this week people will take that in, in and it might change their approach. It might help them understand who they are as leaders and become better leaders. Lord uh, Victor Adebowale, CBE, is the Chief Executive of Turning Point, an organisation some of you will have certainly heard about. Um, he received his CBE in the year 2000 and has gone on to do um, some fantastic things working across the public sector and but specifically in the third sector. Um, Victor has been involved in a number of task force groups and advises the government on mental health, on learning disabilities, um, is co-chair of the Black and Minority Ethnic Mental Health National Steering Group, is part of the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, um, and on and on and on. His accolades are, and his experience is tremendous. We did um, have uh, Lord Adebowale come and talk at one of the Public Service Management Wales Expos, which we think was probably anywhere between nine and 12 years ago. We can't quite pin it down. Um, so, um, and he was inspiring then, and I have no doubt will be inspiring this afternoon. So if I could ask you to put your hands together, please, for Lord Victor Adebowale. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. I um, Well, follow, following June, I mean, I don't know what to, what to say, to be honest. Um, so, uh, bye. <laughs> no, actually, actually, I've been practising this all morning, right? So I've got to get, this is it for me. If I can do this, then I'm, I'm all right. I've got to get this. Pronunda. Yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> God, dear me. Right, no, I can pack it in. I can go. <laughs> it's a bit like um, Adibawali. It's like, can you say Adibawali? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's Welsh. <laughs> I usually start off by saying, actually, it's a good old Yorkshire name. But, it but I've got to get some things off my chest to, to start with, because um, I know it worries people. This, I'll tell you what worries people. It's this bit. Do you know what I mean? Because people think, what do I call him, right? And some people are thinking, well, how did he arrive here? <laughs> I know that's what you're thinking. <laughs> it's all right. Helicopter. <laughs> duck house. <laughs> you know. Car, actually. But since our most friends, I was, I was going to make a joke about a multicultural audience, but I won't. Um, <laughs> You can all call me uh, Professor Lord at Radibowali, <laughs> CBE. <laughs> now, Victor, Victor will do nicely. Um, I'm going to try and I'm going to talk to you for a bit, and then I'm going to stop, right? Because I'm hoping that we might have a chat, because I always think that there's no such thing as an expert, <laughs> and none of us know, really. Uh, none of us know. <laughs> We're all here to find out. So am I. So you might have a, have a conversation. Is that OK? Yeah. I'll say some things that are uh, about sort of personal, that, that what I think. I might, I may or may not use some models. I don't know. And then we'll have a chat. And we'll try and work out what this thing called leadership is here and now in Wales. Is that OK? On my way here, I drove through. I got completely lost, by the way. Um, and the reason why I'm wearing jeans is, anyway, um, so, <laughs> yeah, there's people thinking though, exactly, so, so, so on my way here, I was driving, driving through Wales, I came down from Yorkshire, I was driving through Wales, and I was thinking about the Welsh public services and, and Wales, and, you know, actually, it, it builds on what June was saying about why I'm here, <laughs> actually, I'm here because of the NHS. Because when I was a baby, I was quite a sickly baby. In fact, the start of my biography, if I ever write it, will be what my mother said to me a, f a few years ago. She said, you know, at the age of two, you died. <laughs> so my heart stopped. And I was rushed to hospital. And, you know, yeah, 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 I'm here now, so that's cool. And the thing about Wales is lots of things started here, like the NHS. Working men got together. And there was a tradition of working men and women, 
I guess it was more men than women then. Putting some money into a pot every week so that you didn't have to pay when you went to see your doctor. And Nye Bevan came down to Wales and he, he saw this was in Tredegar. Is that pronounced correctly? Yeah, yeah. yeah. all right, all right. <laughs> <sighs> I can get the goch or goch bit, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Tredegar. He, um, he, uh, I'll throw one out at you, actually. Mafori Edanu, Nigerian. <laughs> yeah, all right, yeah. And give as good as I get. So, so he came down to Tredegar and he saw this. And he thought, this is fantastic. This was self-organized, people coming together to do something that was necessary for themselves without government. They just did it because it had to be done. And he thought, this is scalable. This is absolutely scalable. And he went back to London and he started writing papers and notes. Some of you know the history more than I do. I'm not a history student. But we ended up with the NHS. He started here. Now, it would be absolutely wrong of me to stand up here and pretend that the future is rosy. Or to pretend that it's easy and just with some passion and some, whoa, everything's going to be okay, because you know it, it ain't. Some of you are facing wicked problems. Right? But I'll tell you something. I'll start, hopefully, how I will finish which is that your biggest challenge isn't that you cannot deliver services to the public. And I'll say a bit more about what I mean by services to the public. That's not your problem. Your problem is that the history of Wales is that it's led the way in the delivery of such services. And if you want the future, and I think Wales could teach all of us, I mean, <laughs> could teach all of us across the UK how to do things, and hopefully we'll, we'll get into explaining why, understand the people that receive those services. You with me? I should say, my ego's never involved in these discussions. It's one of the benefits of having these things, <laughs> like CBEs and all that sort. You, they talk, your ego's assuaged. So if the back row want to go to the cinema, I mean, I'm, I'm cool with that. <laughs> I'm cool. I haven't got any, I don't do slides either. So if, anyway. So I think some of the future of services to the public lies in the past. Some things that we've forgotten we need to remember. All right. Well, let me tell you a little um, a story. Actually, services to the public. People... Uh, I talk about services to the public rather than public services. Do you know why? <coughs> of course you don't, because I'm about to tell you. We have, we labour across the UK. It's just a thought. I'm going to throw it out. We labour under the conception, the, the misconception in my view, a kind of, a kind of stuck in aspect. When we talk about public services, what often comes to people's minds, and I think this creates the argument that many use to argue that many of you are a waste of money and a waste of time. You, you've heard that, haven't you? I mean, I'm not going to say... I'm, the argument's more sophisticated than that, but that's what it boils down to, isn't it? That's what you hear. Is that the term public service, as soon as you say it to someone, it means the council, the NHS, bureaucracy, no choice, get what you're given, lime green walls, lowest common denominator. It shouldn't mean that, but that's what it's come to mean in many people's view. But I want to tell you, I want to just throw out something. You know, there was a banking crisis in 2008. I'm not going to pretend. I, I, I've said this. I've stood up in the House of Lords. And I said this, and I got, I got, I got um, some, uh, some bankers come, up, come after me afterwards. I said uh, it was the biggest bank robbery in the history of Western capitalism, and it was an inside job. <laughs> the buggers got away with it, but there you go. But I'm going to ask you a question. 
What is a public service in the context of the banking crisis? In fact, what is a public service in the context of the internet? How many of you can get on without access to a bank account? The supermarket? The internet? Telephones? They're all considered private, but they are also public. And with the reason why I say they're public is that when they go wrong, we have to rescue them. The same goes for adult social care, the large-scale provision by the private sector. Now, I'm telling you this not to make a political point. It's not a political point. It's just a fact. The history of the last what, five, ten years, that's a fact. I'm throwing that out as a question because I think the future of what we consider to be public services doesn't lie in the paradigm that says public services are all provided by the public institutions. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> Actually, the future of what you call public services, I think, lies in this notion of services to the public. And that implies a different set of skills, a different set of notions about how you operate, who you work with, how you collaborate. But I want to just slide that to one side while I tell you a story, actually. It's a turning point story. Turning point, by the way, is an organization I work for, although I'm not working for Turning Point now. I'm working for Leadership in Mind, which focuses on leadership. I lead a complicated life, all right? And just, uh, actually, it's worth telling you a little bit about it because I'm the chief executive of Turning Point. We employ 4,000 people, operate in 250 locations, provide mental health, learning disabilities, substance misuse, primary care, employment services to a population the size of Blackpool and Scarborough, I'm told. One person, every hour, leaves our services drug and alcohol free. I know that because we measure it. They don't come back, at least for a year, I hope. I hope I never see them again, to be honest, because they're tricky. But, you know, I also sit on the board of an IT company, and I set up something called Collaborate precisely because we're not very good at collaborating. <laughs> we talk about it, but we're not very good at doing it. So I set up a community interest company to do just that. Before I talk about it, let me tell you a, a, an absolute a, a kind of a story that some of you might recognize. You still with me? Oh, thank God for that. One of our services, one of Turning Point services in Margate, I went to visit this service, right? We employ, but in this service, we employ GPs, highly qualified people. Um, in fact, the chap I was talking to used to be a general surgeon, and um, now he, he, he works for us. He, he retrained as a GP, which is unheard of in the NHS. I mean, really, brilliant guy, and loads of other GPs. And I'm talking to them about what the work that they do. And while I was doing it, one of our clients came in, and he had an appointment to see the GP. This guy had had a drug problem for at least 10 years, on and off. And uh, the doctor said to me, well, I'm going to see this, this, this client. And the bloke was coughing. <coughs> Went in, saw him. And I said, what happened there? He said, well, you know, I treated him. I gave, we, we looked after his drug problem. And I said, he had a bit of a cough. He said, yeah, I know, it's probably bronchitis. I said, uh, did you treat that? that? What happened? He said, well, yeah, I sent him to his GP. I said, what? But you're qualified, aren't you? He went, yeah, but we don't have a contract to provide services to people who come in with coughs. I said, but you know that he had bronchitis. He said, yeah, absolutely. I said, what are the chances of this chap go actually going to his GP? He said about 20% because of his lifestyle. Now, I'm a man, right? Men are typical. I'm, I think I'm a reasonably healthy man. I haven't got a drug problem. I think I'm mentally OK, although ask me again in about an hour. <laughs> and even I have trouble going to the GP. 
that's when I can get an appointment. And by the way, the GP's near me. You've got to be bleeding from the eyes before you can get an appointment. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There's somebody at the front like that. You're not ill enough. <laughs> get out. Get out. Right? This guy, 20% chance of him going to the, his GP. So if he doesn't go to the GP, those of you that are medically qualified know he's not going to get any better. He's probably going to get worse. He's likely, he's likely to end up in A&E really ill and with a drug problem and with a mental health problem because I've yet to meet anyone who takes poisonous substances regularly who doesn't have a mental health problem. Right? So forget about the, the morality surrounding that case. Think about the cost. So because some forms needed to be filled in to protect someone's budget and the CCG, public health, local government, this one person is probably going to cost thousands when he could, when he could have cost a hundred, maybe two. That, that is what services to the public is about. <coughs> Times that 2,000 add ignorance and we can really start wasting some money. Hmm? So my challenge has never been, it's never been about the cuts. It, I don't really care. I know it sounds awful and you're going to really hammer me. But it's not about the money. It's about what you do with it. And to underline that point in a more systematic way, let me tell you about something called Connected Care, which actually we attempted to bring to Wales to no avail. Now, here is a story of system leadership or the lack of it. So I spent about four years uh, developing something based on, well before the recession, by the way, based on my experiences working on the most deprived estates in the UK. And what I noticed, and I'll just, I'll say this now, I'll, I'll ask some people, what I noticed on those deprived estates wasn't the lack of public services. I mean, by public services, I mean social services, housing, health. I didn't, I didn't education. I noticed that these services were present in these places. Yes? But what I also noticed was the deprivation, the sheer lack of engagement and the language that was used. When people talked about social services, they talked about the welfare. This was 10 years ago. People didn't talk about social services. They didn't talk about their care plans. Although I've noticed how easy it is for individuals to take on the language of the services that they use. They become better experts than the experts at the bureaucracy. You notice that? And I thought, this is really weird. If I was running a business, a shop, and most of my customers were choosing not to use my service, that would really worry me, particularly if I knew they needed it. It's like people, it's like somebody walking in, well, it's like somebody walking into a shop. It's like the shopkeeper knowing when it's raining, pouring down with rain and freezing cold, that people would rather go, forgive me, bare-chested than buy their waterproof coats, don't you think? And so I got together with some people and I started asking questions. The question being, why aren't people using the services that are there, firstly? What is it about the design, delivery, the mechanisms of public services that mean that these people don't benefit? Does any of you recognise that? Do you recognise, those of you that work on, I'm not asking you to put your hands up or anything, it's just a couple of nods, I'm just, you know, I want to orientate myself. It just seemed really bizarre. And I talked to the Director of Housing and he gave me an explanation, I talked to the Director of Social Services, they gave me an explanation, all from within their own department. Ultimately, without going into the details about what explanations were, it, it boiled down to, it's their fault. They don't understand the system. 
They're born idle. They don't get it. That shocked me to the core. Let me tell you something. I was in the House of Lords once, right? and I was sat next to Stanley Carnes. Now, you, some of you might not know who Stanley Carnes is, but he's, he's the chap who set up Dixon's. And he said to me, we, we exchanged information about ourselves in that Johari Windows way. <laughs> and um, he said to me, he said, it's funny, you, don't know, you do all this work with um, social services and whatnot. He said, I'm, I'm, I've done work with government. What I notice is there's all this policy stuff and it all comes down from on that. He said, when I started, I opened a shop in Olgate and I sold slightly out of market electronics and they sold like hotcakes and I made some money so I opened another shop. But another one, another one, another one. I had 20 shops before I started putting policy together. Why don't we do, why don't we operate like that? I said, I don't know. Anyway, back to connected care. So we got together and we started thinking about what is it about these services? And we started talking to people, not just in the, on this estate, but across a whole range of estates. Really in-depth discussions about what it is that people need, want. How do they engage? What stops them, was the question, in a way. What is it? Cut a long story short, the following things became apparent. And this is going to sound really obvious, but you know what? <laughs> and really relevant to Wales. But in my experience, it's one, one of the things we forget all the time. Poor people aren't stupid. Knowledge is valuable, but it tends to be valued in the middle classes. So we found that the poorest people knew, more, knew the most about their communities, who was there, why they were there, what works, what didn't work for them, how to get round the bureaucracy, how to abuse it, how to... Massive amounts of knowledge. We found that actually the services weren't designed with or for them. That's why they didn't use them. I mean, most of you in this room know how to navigate, don't you? You know enough about how the services work to navigate those services on behalf of yourself, your families, and even you find it frustrating. I know that because I do, and I'm a lord, <laughs> right? They just didn't bother. They found other ways. So we spent years designing a methodology, and this methodology basically devolved power. It moved power to, from the institutions, local government, health, into the community and it gave them the money and the means by which they might understand, create and deliver services that were integrated. And I don't mean big society, I've got, I've got no problem with big society, big society is fantastic. A blinding glimpse of the obvious but fantastic nevertheless, society is big, a big like the sky. <laughs> Kindness is lovely, Kindness is lovely. Unfortunately, it's not equally distributed, which is why we have services to the public in the first place. So, we discovered that if you pay people, you value their knowledge in the same way that you might value your knowledge, if you provide people with the infrastructure, the means by which they may well create and understand and value what, what they've got, and thus think about what they haven't got and what they need and how they need it. They don't ask for the earth, by the way. They tend to ask for less than they're entitled to and less than they're worth. They devise services, the likes of which I've not seen before, services that were truly integrated around the needs of that community, bespoke services that were preventative and that employed people in that community. And we developed this service and we had it evaluated by the LSE and um, London School of Economics and we know that for every one pound spent you save on this service, the savings are between eight and 14 pounds, right? So we know, we know it works, we know it's value added. You might be asking yourself, so why isn't it happening everywhere? Why doesn't it happen?
Most of you in this room will have one or two examples of really good services. Surely, that, don't you? Just things that you think are really good and you think should be happening everywhere. So let me tell you, I'm not a proponent of letting a thousand flowers bloom. I think it wastes fertilizer. If you look, certainly if you look at the private sector, what they do is find out what works and make sure it works everywhere. So why, why doesn't that happen? Why doesn't good stuff that works and saves money spread? I think it's because public services, services to the public, have a real crisis of values and attention and leadership. And let me start with the values question. You see, I think the most important person, the person that really inspires me, isn't necessarily my team or even the thought of doing good. It's that person who turned up in Margate with a cough and a 10-year drug problem. Because that person is not that dissimilar from the person that inspired the NHS. The inspiration for change should come, in my humble opinion, from the people who pay, receive and deserve better. And if you want to know what the genesis of all collaboration is, or oh, by the way, collaboration is really hard work. It's like, it's much easier to compete. Don't you think? Compete, competition is like dead exciting. Like if I got, I don't know, I haven't got it on, on me at the moment, but if I had 50,000 pounds, <laughs> some people going, I bet he has, he's a lord. <laughs> Flog his helicopter, 50 grand, cheeky bastard. Anyway. 50 grand, right? Throw it up in the air, like, <coughs> dive in, right? Dead exciting. Get out of the way. <coughs> My money's on you, sir. <laughs> Dead exciting. If I walk in and say, you know what? There's only 50 grand between you, and you've got to find a way of distributing it. Right? You've got to find a currency that enables you to distribute. God, that, that involves some work. That does involve some work, doesn't it? You've got to think about it. You've got to put your own personal <coughs> pursuit to one side. You've got to think about what motivates you to bother. And you've got to think about why you're doing it. In other words, the reason has to be in the centre of the room, otherwise you're not going to do it. You know, some of you will have experienced this. I know you have. You walk into a room... And you walk into a room in order to collaborate. And the meeting might be called, let's collaborate. Why not? And you walk into the room and somebody says, our objective is to collaborate. And you sit there and the chair tells you what the objectives are. Yeah? And you all contribute. But as you contribute and you're thinking, I can't walk out of here. I don't know why I'm looking at you. I'm just... I can't walk out of here having given anything away because it's my budget. It's my budget. I ain't doing it. Yeah, yeah, I'll use the word collaborate. Yes, let's collaborate. Let's absolutely collaborate. Let's do it. Let's collaborate. Phew, hell no. <laughs> right? And you walk out of the room having had a great meeting, but achieved absolutely zero. I did some work for the Metropolitan Police on mental health. Uh, why is it that people, too many people die when the Met Police engage with them, when they've got mental health crises? And one of the things we discovered was the sheer number of collaboration, collaborative meetings that occur in London. We, we worked out the cost per year. I didn't actually put it in the report, I was so shocked. It was millions in terms of the hours spent of highly paid people in a room. And yet, if you have a mental health crisis in London, the ambulance service 
you've not committed a crime, are unlikely to attend. The police might, and if you look like me, there's a very good chance that you might end up injured or dead. Pfft, what is that about? So, I think collaboration is hard, but it's necessary. And it's necessary because the people at the centre, people generally aren't in rooms like this, but they obviously include you, the users of public services, are hardly ever at the centre of the debate. And the conversation ought to be something like, this is, the, this is the challenge, this is what we've got to change for these people, this is why we've got to change it, what's your contribution? If your contribution is, well, I can't possibly do that because my budget. If your contribution is, well, this person has to change. If only they went to that service or this service, everything would be better. If your contribution is silence, you shouldn't be in the room. There is no point. You are wasting time. And it's not your time you're wasting. It's their time. It's a bit like risk. Often, in public services, you hear that. You must have heard it. Put in the NHS. I'm on the board of NHS England. Heard all the time. We can't do it. It's too risky. And the question that always comes to my mind is, who for? Because generally, the person taking the risk is the person at the sharp end, i.e. the client, not the professional who is making the decision. Something about risk awareness as opposed to risk aversion as an excuse for not, cha not changing anything. How are we doing? Hmm. So, we could be collaborating. We could be collaborating. But you have to start with the individual and or the community at the centre. And if you don't understand the individual and or the community, I don't think you can collaborate. I don't think you've got a reason to collaborate. You don't have a reason. So, I'm going to say two more things and I'm going to shut up because I'd rather have a chat with you guys. And anyway, you're probably bored witless by now. I want to tell you two things. The first is really about what I think leadership is. And some of you, you'll have heard that you're going to hear a lot about this during the course of this week. And I have to say, I've not, I've not come across the Welsh Academy before. What a luxury it is to spend a week talking about services to the public. Because <laughs> in England, we, we've cut out the Leadership Academy. <laughs> You've got to do it online. Yeah, it's online. There's something powerful about being able to talk to each other. But to my mind, the difference between leadership and management is the investment of emotion in the outcome. Do you understand? You know, anyone, well, not anyone, rearranging the deck chairs more efficiently, more effectively, is necessary. Don't get me wrong. But understanding why you need deck chairs in the first place, whether the ship is in the right place, I'm assuming the deck chairs are on the ship, just in case. taking people to understand, actually, we don't quite know where we're going, but we need to get there. That is what leadership's about. And you never get there. I don't get, I'm not there. You know, I, I note, I note this, that your, um, your opening <coughs> salvo was beware of charismatic leaders then you ask me to get up and give a keynote address. I mean, I don't, don't know quite what to make of that. <laughs> the point is, you always, you, me, we, are always on a journey. And that journey should be challenging. It should be about a state of mind which is leaderful. It's not about a set of characteristics that are like the last leader that you last met. It's not about being a man or a woman or 
having gone to Box Bridge or it's about having a personal commitment to the individuals who aren't usually in the room. Now, I've got loads of models. I drew all these models on this flip chart, and I've decided, you know what, enough already. I'm going to stop. I think, I, I would say, and I say this without a hint of irony or um, even, I just think you have a fantastic opportunity in Wales. I really do think that. I think that because, actually, when you look up, there's no one there. So you're forced to look out. Do you understand what I'm saying? That actually the necessity created by the demands of an ageing population, I think it's going to increase something like 20% by 2020, or is it 80%? I don't remember. I don't know, but it's a lot. You probably know. The fact that you're faced with, well, you were always faced with this, with increasing levels of poverty, The fact that, actually, you need to recreate. There are three types of public services. You can't just do bureau bureaucracy. You can't just do mun municipalism. You can't just change the job titles. You have to change the services from the ground up. Given Wales's history, given what I know this country has done and what it could do, I just think that you could be showing the rest of the UK the way. And, you know, the only evidence you've got, the only evidence, why I don't really believe in strategy and strategic plans, the only evidence you've got on which you can base any thoughts about the future is what you've done in the past. Thank you very much.